always, Mayor Kaplan, for being here with us today. Um, before we start with the, the solar panel information session, um, just quickly, a few of you have some of these. Melissa is handing them out, and I'll have more of them at the end if anyone's interested. Um, this summer, we're hosting an environmental program uh, series with Miami Waterkeeper. About uh, It includes environmental advocacy and awareness and civic engagement, um, how to speak to your uh, legislators about different environmental policies. Um, there's three sessions through the summer, and um, all of them are open to the public, and we'd love to have everyone involved. Um, and if you have more questions about that, you can see me after uh, the session is over. And so I'd like to introduce Jody from FL Sun. Uh, she has been working to uh, create solar co-ops like the one that she's cre creating with uh, including Cuba's game. Um, and right now they're working on creating six co-ops per um, in Miami-Dade County. Uh, usually it's six per state. Yeah, they usually do six per state, but because you know we're the Sunshine State and Miami-Dade is very dense, uh, they're doing six just for Miami-Dade County. Cuba's game is going to be part of Central Miami North Co-op. Um, and that includes Coral Gables, uh, City West Miami, Palmetto, City of West Miami, Miami West to the bottom. Great. So uh, without further ado, I'll let uh, Jody go on with the, everything else. <laughs> Thank you, Ron. Thank you all for coming out tonight, and thank you, Mayor and Vice Mayor. Uh, my name is Jody Finver, and I am the Miami Dade coordinator for a nonprofit called FL Sun. Uh, we're going to be covering a lot of material tonight. I'm going to try to be as informational and as entertaining as possible. Um, and um, I will answer any of your questions, but if you can wait until the end of each session, because there's a chance that I might get to your question before you get a chance to ask it from the slides. And we'll be dimming the lights so it's a little easier to see, and then we'll be bringing them back up when it's time to talk about the handouts that you have. The first thing that we're going to be going over is just who we are, the, who FL Sun is, and how we got started. So FL Sun, um, we are putting the sunshine to work in the sunshine state, and we're simply just a network of people who are taking control of our energy by installing solar and generating our own. Back in 2007, these two boys here, Walter and Diego, lived in Mount Pleasant, Washington, D.C., and they went to see an inconvenient truth. Anybody see it? So the movie really impressed upon them. They got home, they were talking with their folks, and Walter said to his mother, Anya Schoolman, can we go solar? We've got to go solar. We need to do something. Can we go solar? And his mother, Anya, had said, you know, I looked into this. There are only two installers in the area. I got two totally different estimates. I don't know what I'm looking at. All I know is that it's way too much money. She didn't want to kill the idea completely, so she said to the boys, Listen, if you talk to some other neighbors, and maybe if they're interested in going solar too, we could get a better deal if we do it together. And she didn't think anything was going to come of it. But the two boys, creative flyers, they got on their bikes, they rode around all through Mount Pleasant saying, to go solar, who wants to go solar, who wants to go solar, and sure enough, people wanted to go solar. At the time, it wasn't all that easy to go solar. They didn't know anything about what net metering is, which we'll get into a bit later. There are different kind of credit systems that they had in Washington, D.C., dealing with permitting issues from their municipality. So they, um, because it was this group of homeowners that wanted to go solar, more contractors were interested in participating in this process than just the two that originally gave the estimate. Fast forward two years, and a whole bunch of estimates have come in, and they're sitting around the coffee table in Anya's house. And a group of the homeowners sat and went through all the estimates, and together they chose one installer for the entire project. Of the 50 homes that were interested in going solar, 45 signed contracts. And thus was the birth of our nation's first solar cooperative. <laughs> so word gets out, what's a solar co-op? Who's this woman, Anya? Hey, can she do this in our neighborhood? And all these different neighborhoods in Washington, D.C. start calling her saying, hey, can you help us out? Can you show us how to do this solar co-op thing? What is it that you do? And she helped them out. And it was keeping her so busy that she created DC Sun, the sun standing for Solar United Neighborhoods. Even more word is getting out from all the states nearby in DC that this woman, Anya Smolman, is creating this solar co-op. And it keeps her so busy that she created Community Power Network. And from that, we have DC Sun, Ohio Sun, Virginia Sun, West Virginia Sun, Maryland Sun, and Florida Sun. Florida Sun got started because this woman, Mary Du Bois, was listening to Anya on an interview on NPR. She lived in Orange County, and she's thinking, 
We're in the Sunshine State. Why are they having solar co-ops in Washington, D.C.? We need these here. So she called Community Power Network up and said, can you guys come down and show us how to do one of these solar co-ops? Mary partnered with the Unitarian Universalists in Orange County, and Community Power Network came down, taught them everything that they needed to know, a little bit of solar technology, what to look for in, when you're putting out estimates, and um, how to finance your panels, and they created Orange County's first solar co-op. It was so impressive for Orange County that Mary reached out to the League of Women Voters Florida and said, we need to do a grant, we need to bring this everywhere throughout the entire state. Everywhere that there's a League of Women Voters, we want a co-op. And that is what happened. Miami has, um, is going to have six solar co-ops, but thus far we have launched co-ops in Orange County, Space Coast, St. Pete, Sarasota, East Broward, West Broward, Alachua is going on right now, Seminole County just launched last night. We're launching Palm Beach, Tampa, North Pinellas, and Volusia in the fall. Again, it was said, typically we do six in a state for a year, but Miami's the size of Rhode Island. And they said, hey, you guys are really big. You got a lot of solar potential down there. We want six. And we reached out to the Green Corridor, which are the early adopters of um, solar and renewable energy partnering with PACE programs. And the Green Corridor was comprised of Miami Shores, City of Miami, Coral Gables, South Miami, Pinecrest, Cutler Bay, is that seven? City of Miami, Coral Gables, Miami Shores, uh, Key Biscayne wasn't a part of the founding, the founding fathers. The seven, it's Pinecrest, yes, yeah, South Miami, Palmetto Bay, Cutler Bay. Um, these mayors and commissioners uh, adopt, were the early adopters and worked with the PACE program, Y Green, and put forward a grant to bring these six co-ops here. Key Biscayne is part of Central Miami North. At the same time, I've also launched what's called Central Miami South, and that's Pinecrest and South Miami westward all the way to the boundary of the county. So these are very large areas, and I'm trying to get as many homeowners as possible to show an interest in going solar. And now we're moving on to the big, the big stuff. This is um, myself and Simon in the back over there. This is our home in Coconut Grove. We went solar in 2015. There is nothing like knowing that the sunshine is creating the electricity that you are using. So the first thing that we're going to be talking about tonight is solar technology. Then I'm going to get into how these co-ops work and also various ways that you can be financing your panels and solar economics. So the first thing you need to know that we're talking about is that this is solar photovoltaic, also known as PV. This isn't the same as solar hot water. This is the solar that converts um, into electricity, as seen on your rooftop there and also there. Solar is seen that what we're talking about are rigid panels that go on your rooftop. Some people do ground mount installations if they're on farms or they have large areas of land, but most typically what we see in Miami Dade are going to be rooftop solar installations. Big solar panels that are about the size of an American flag, so three feet by five feet, or as I say, two Jodies equals one panel. When you put a bunch of panels together, you have what's called a solar array. We're also going to be talking, you're going to hear phrases like racking system and inverters. When sun hits these panels, the electricity that's created is direct current, or DC. Everything that's in your house runs on alternating current, or AC, so it has to go through an inverter of some sort to change from DC to AC. The terminology that you'll be hearing is kilowatts and kilowatt hours. When we talk about kilowatts, kilowatts are, is the overall capacity of a system. Uh, that is, the entire thing that is on your roof will be measured in kilowatts. The energy that it is producing at any particular moment in time during the day is measured in kilowatt hours. What you see on your FPL bill is measured in kilowatt hours. Most homes down here will install a 2 to 12 kilowatt system. If you figure that one panel, for the sake of simple math, has 250 watts, Four of them together would be a thousand watts, or one kilowatt. If you put eight of them together, you got two kilowatts, and if you put 12 of them together, you got three kilowatts, and so on, and so on, and so on. So down here, we're typically seeing it's, it, it'll hover between nine to 10 kilowatts. If you carry a system that is larger than 10 kilowatts, 
FPL requires a million dollars in liability insurance. It hasn't stopped the homes that want that size system. It's um, something to discuss with your insurance broker, whether it's added onto your regular insurance or it's considered in an umbrella policy. But it is something good to know that if you're gonna have a really large system, just to bear in mind about the liability insurance. So we've got a whole bunch of different terms that we've been talking about. Now we're gonna string them all together and we're gonna put them on your roof. So the first thing you're gonna see is this is the racking mount and this attaches to your roof. And there are perforations that are made into the roof, but they are waterproofed. Everything that I'm gonna be discussing tonight is Miami-Dade hurricane windstorm compliant. We have the hardest, most stringent uh, rules in the state, and uh, so everything is going to be compliant to prepare and be okay for storms. So you have the racking mount that is attached to the roof, and then the panels clamp down onto them. And then there's wiring that runs underneath it. Now, as I was saying, we have to talk about the inverters. There are two different kinds of inverters that a system could have. One is called a central inverter. If all of the panels are strung up in a line, all of that DC energy goes at one time into the central inverter and is transformed into AC. Or you could have what are called microinverters. Microinverters are up on your roof as opposed to a central inverter. As you can see, it's down. It could be outside. It could be in your garage. If you were up north, it would be in your basement. So a microinverter is up on your roof and it's independent. Each panel is corresponds to its own microinverter and it transforms that panel's energy from DC to AC right on the roof. DC to AC, DC to AC. They all work separate from one another. A central inverter system all works together. As I say, it's like the board in Star Trek. All of that energy at one time. If you have a big open sunny roof with no obstructions at all, a central inverter system is great. If you have some obstructions through the day, you might consider a microinverter system. There's also, with the central inverter, something that's called an optimizer that some installers will offer. And an optimizer corresponds to the panels just in the same way that a microinverter would. And it helps balance out the energy through the system in case shade, a cloud, bamboo from the neighbor's tree, a poinciana, at three in the afternoon is casting shade on a system. The optimizers optimize the power of the panels to help compensate for any draw that would come from shade. So big open area, central inverters are wonderful. Some shade and obstruction during the day, you might want to be looking into microinverters or a central inverter system with an optimizer. We also have what's called the bi-directional meter. All right, is anybody here already solar? Okay, so all of you have a unidirectional meter. That means that your meter is only going to see the energy that is delivered to your house from FPL. With a bi-directional meter, it measures the electricity that is delivered to your house from FPL in the evening, as well as the energy that any energy that your house isn't using at that moment during the day, it's what's received from FPL. So it can go both ways. It measures what is received and what's delivered. With optimizers and with microinverters, you have what a monitor. It's an array that sits inside your house and it lets you see all of the panels, how they're performing independently of one another. You can get cool apps on your phone that let you know how many uh, minutes you have powered the Eiffel Tower. You can get really geeky. Um, you can Simon gets super geeky with his phone and compares how much energy his system is creating as opposed to his brothers who in North Carolina. And when I say you can get geeky, I'm not lying. You will get really geeky with the apps and just be fascinated with how much energy your panels are producing during the day. When it's all put together, if you have a flat roof, it can look something like this where you have the racking mount and then the panels on it. Uh, solar down here can be on barrel tile roofs, it can be on standing seam, it can be on asphalt shingle, it can be on flat concrete tiles. There's pretty much any, you can do an installation on anything. If you have a standing seam metal roof, you are a solar installer's dream come true because there are no preparations that are required. It just, it attaches onto, the racking on attaches to the standing seam. 
How does it connect to your electrical panel? It's a pretty simple connection. Most homes don't need to do any upgrades, but when an installer comes to your house, they'll take a look at the box and tell you, does it need an upgrade or not? Most of the homes are, um, have done sufficient upgrades at this point in time that nobody is dealing with knob and tube or having a panel that can't handle more electricity. What makes for a good site for solar? First and foremost, uh, we don't want too much shading. If you have trees, uh, we love trees. Trees lower the temperature inside your house. They also lower the ambient temperature outside in the ground. Um, they give us oxygen, and who doesn't love oxygen? If you have to trim trees for storm season, that's great, but if you have trees that are covering your roof, it might not be suitable for solar. What we look for are homes that um, face in a southerly direction. East and west is also good. West is really good because that means that your panels are producing energy later in the day when people are coming home and getting their kids home from school and using electricity. So during peak hours, you're still creating electricity if you have western exposure. But southern is the ideal exposure. Uh, and you want to have enough space to mount the panels. We're looking for at least 200 square feet. Uh, that would give you for like about a 3KW system. So we want nice sunny roofs. We want at least 200 square feet. For most homes on Key Biscayne, that's not a huge challenge, um, as well as the homes in the Grove. Um, it's just making sure that they don't have too much trees and shade obstructions. So how does the solar um, work? These are grid-tied systems. When I'm talking about, we're not in Alaska, we're not off-grid. Um, batteries are um, something that are ancillary to the co-op itself. They are something that is possible. Installers all deal with battery systems. They're just not part of the co-op process because right now they're a bit cost prohibitive and a lot of people don't really need, uh, require battery backup because we're not, we don't lose energy for that long of a time in case it's, unless we're dealing with a storm season and a lot of people have natural gas backup as well. Um, but again, batteries are, it's a conversation to have with the installer. They do give the pricing for it, but it's just not part of the co-op itself. When the sun hits these panels, and the DC, it goes from DC, it goes down into the inverter, and it gets changed into AC. If you are home during the day, you're using the refrigerator, um, the, you're watching videos and stuff, your panels are producing energy, and you're using that energy right at that moment. If it's during the day and you're out running errands or you're off at work, you've raised the AC temperature up, the lights aren't on, your panels are producing energy and the house is using energy, not as much as if you were home. So that extra energy goes out into the line and it's supplied to the homes that are near you that are using energy. So if there is a retiree that's living near you that watches the Big Bang Theory and reruns all day on TBS, <coughs> you're supplying energy to that house because you're not home using it. And the stay-at-home um, mom who just had a, a baby, you're supplying energy to that house. So if you're home and this, the panels are working, you're using that energy at the time. And if you're not home, the energy is being created, but it goes out into the line, it's distributed. And the way that that is kept track of is through net metering. So I'll give you a chance to soak up this beautiful illustration. <laughs> Um, and there are various ways to describe and to debate how to describe net metering, but basically it's that in the evening you're using FPL. During the day you're creating energy and you're either using it or you're supplying it out into the grid. It's kept, um, FPL keeps track of what you're consuming and what you're producing, what you're consuming and what you're producing all throughout the day. And even if you're looking at your meter, you can see it changing back and forth all through the day. So net metering is a law that we have in the state of Florida, and it allows the flow of electricity to and from a customer. One kilowatt hour consumed is equal to one kilowatt hour that you produce. You are, uh, FPL will keep track of this all through the day. You are creating energy, and you're creating this line of credit, if you will. And it's all these kilowatt hours, all these kilowatt hours that you have created during the day. At night, you're using FPL, you're withdrawing those credits. And then the next day, you're creating a line of credit, and then you're withdrawing from these credits. It rolls all that extra energy that you have created that you haven't used, is credited to your account. So the amount of electricity used minus the amount of electricity produced 
equals your bill. And we have our very own Lawton Childs to thank for that because he wrote the original net metering law that is in place across the country. Now, the results that I'm about to show you will vary based on roof size, electrical use, and your budget. Those are the three things that determine how big of a system you're going to install. The size of your roof, the size of your energy bill, and the size of your wallet. Prior to going solar, our bill was 110.29. We did everything that we could to lower our utility bill before we went solar. We had a single speed pump, we switched to a variable speed pump. It uses less energy and it's a heck of a lot wider. We added insulation, we did LED bulbs, we had the low argon insulated glass. Everything that we could to lower the bill so that when we went solar we were getting the bang for our buck. So it was $110. And then it went down to $9.42. <laughs> That's a pretty significant drop. Now this, the first time I looked at this, this is what your dashboard would look like after you go solar. And the first time I looked at this, I said, hey, our bill's in the 30s. And Simon said, no, dummy, that's the temperature outside. It's in the 90s. It's going to be stinking hot back in August of 2016. This year, that's our bill, 942, 942, 942, 942. It rolls every um, month. The extra energy that you are creating is credited to your account. You see a lower bill. That extra energy at the end of the year, if there is a surplus, FPL buys it back huh. at a wholesale rate, uh, about under three cents a kilowatt hour. So the amount of money that you're getting from producing all that excess energy can buy you like some scones and a couple of coffees. Um, it's not it's not to retire on um, we had the credit to our account but at the end of the year you have to also bear in mind that the Sun is not positioned at the same as it is during the wind and um, during the summer and so our panels are producing as much as they would in the summertime so we had a utility bill even with the credit and that utility bill was about thirty dollars which isn't all that bad <laughs> When the power goes out, these panels will shut off. That is a safety mechanism because there's going to be an FPL line worker out there trying to restore power to your neighborhood and you don't want to electrocute them. If you have a generator, uh, the installer just simply needs to know they have to do a transfer switch to make sure that the panels are off, that the generator can go on, that both aren't working at the same time, and that the generator goes off and the panels go on when power is restored panels turn on. We have images of a co-op member who lived up on the, um, in Orange County area and when um, Hurricane Matthew came around, she sent us some video and photos, fell limbs, tiles missing from the roofs, panels beautiful, nothing. Because, and one other thing to um, consider is that when you're doing a rooftop installation, the racking mount is perpendicular to the trusses in your roof. So you've got like a nice T and it's shoring up your roof. It's actually adding another layer of strength. And we've got lots of fun data to help back that up. Frequently asked questions that we get, what are the warranties? With panels themselves, they are 25 year production, uh, but they are still producing energy well after 25 years. It's just not as efficient as it was when you first got it. Much like most of us in the room, we are not as efficient as we were when we first started out. Um, but we're still working. So it's a 25-year production warranty and 10-year on labor. For central inverters, you've got a 10-year warranty. For microinverters, you have a 25-year warranty. All of this stuff is pretty much plug and play. It's installed and you don't really have to think about it afterwards. Um, some people, it's, um, it's a conversation to have with your broker as to whether there is any kind of upgrading on your homeowner's insurance. And I've been getting questions about the um, citizen's pool. And when we went solar, we called our broker and she said, great, congratulations, and nothing changed on our policy. Other people will say that they, um, that they might um, have to pay more in their premiums. It's a conversation just to have with your broker, but I don't have any information immediately available to say it's definitely this way or that way. Uh, again, maintenance, it's, this is plug and play. If there's dirt that's on the panels, the rain washes it away. Some people like to get on their roof and wash their panels down and gently caress them with microfiber or shanties. 
uh, it's really not necessary. If you lived along a flight path and there was a lot of soot getting on your roof, that might be something to consider, but we haven't washed our panels since 2015, and everything under the roof has been clean. We have the roof painted white. Uh, it was orange concrete barrel tile, and we did a white elastomeric uh, sealant on it, which dropped the temperature inside the house, and everything under the panels is spanking new. Uh, the systems are rated, we can say, you know, 20 to 25 years or 25 to 30 years. Again, these panels still produce energy. The ones that were installed in the 70s, if they had remained on the White House if, um, when President Carter had installed them, they'd still be producing energy just not as much as the ratings that you would get when they're first installed. HOAs are not allowed to prohibit homeowners from going solar, or nor are municipalities. And HOA, we have a solar rights law in the state of Florida. And what it says is that an HOA could say, we don't want the panels facing here, and we don't want them facing here. But if here and here happens to be southerly, or east and west within a certain degree, they cannot stop you from installing them. You have to be able to do an installation that is to being able to produce the amount of energy that it is scheduled to produce. Um, if you have an HOA that you have to deal with, just let me know and I can give you the information. But as soon as uh, HOAs see the solar rights law, they realize they don't have any leg to stand on. And if you live in a historic district, um, if, whether you go through the co-op or you um, go solar on your own, it's a conversation to have with your installer. They will work with you through the permitting process if you have a historic designation. It's also true that if there's a protracted shade period, that you know, will kick in to... You're, you're using energy from your solar panels during the day as well as FPL. I mean, it's, it's all through the day. You're producing, you're using, you're producing, you're using. If it's raining out, your panels, you know, they can be producing a little bit of energy, but you're using FPL through at any time that the panels are not creating kilowatt hours. FPL is supplying you with pretty reliable energy. It's just that when you're producing it yourself, you're producing really reliable, much cheaper energy. A gentleman with a striped shirt. Uh, maybe I missed it, but could you give the specifications of what size your system is and relative to your house size and things like that? So we can take that from context. I'm going to get to that. Okay. I get lots of, I've I added more math. Um, I'm going to, I'll get to that. No, I'm just moving forward to the correct slide. That was off. This woman was before you, and, 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 I'm, and no, I will that was, that was my Okay, yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah. um, Julie Decker. Oh, hi. Hi. I um, have been speaking to solar installers. I've understood that in some municipalities, the electrical code has not been updated, or they're not using the most recent electric code, and that is gets. There are, Do you know where Kiva is on that? No, I don't. I know that the um, some of the issues um, we're dealing with um, unincorporated uh, parts, and there are it's it's getting um, getting people to use the same code. We have like 34 municipalities in Miami-Dade County. Everybody has different permitting processes. Uh, that is why we try to organize the co-ops to. Um, in such a way that the installers aren't having to go across the county for one home in Hialeah and then one home down in Homestead. We're trying to keep it so um, more concentrated so that it's easier for them to do their permits at a particular stage. But with regard to how Kiva gains permitting processes, I don't, I don't know. I'm more boned up on the city of Miami and now unincorporated because I was working the permit process as a volunteer with the legal women voters to try to help make it. As part of this, are you putting any tools together in terms of which municipal ordinances are favorable to streamlining the process? You know? the, well, the co-ops are open to every municipality in the county, and um, I'm trying to be fair and equitable mm -hmm. uh, to allow all. I don't want any homeowner to feel like they can't go solar because it might be a bit more <laughs> challenge in terms of the permits. 
but the, a lot of the solar installers, they know their way around the system. They could, they could grasp about it, but they, they know what they're, they're doing. They just want, they would like uniformity across the board. Well, no, I mean, I'm asking more here because we do have a couple of council members here. So if they're, like, in, in terms of the electric code or, or other... Well, if there are council members here, I can point at that city of Miami, uh, Coral Gables, South Miami, and Miami Beach have all waived permitting fees, and they have expedited uh, the permits. Uh, city of Miami has a three-day turnaround for permits, and they um, they hand walk it through now, which is a big uh, a big improvement from what it was. Uh, Coral Gables had done it. South Miami had just. They just adopted um, waiving fees and expediting their permits, and now I know homeowners are also working in Miami Shores to do the same thing. Good to know. Yeah. Not too much. Wait, wait. Yes. Sir. Talk about the, uh, the case financing. Yes. Okay. I'm going to take one more question, and then we're going to move on because there's a chance that I'm going to be getting to your question. No, no oh, you had your hand up, ma'am. Um, yeah, I have power surges all the time. Is that an issue with this? You said something about the power going out, or will it just kick back once the power comes back when on? When the power comes back on, the panels go back on. <clears throat> okay, we're going to move on to how these co-ops work. So the big perk of joining a co-op is that you can save up to 20% on your installation, first and foremost. Yeah, it's also really nice that you're getting support from FLSAN and Community Power Network. We are helping the homeowners out along the way through the entire process. You're also connecting with fellow solar enthusiasts, and you're becoming part of the solar movement. The more homes that we have going solar, the more advocates we have for fair solar policy. The only way that we will have fair solar policy in the state of Florida is if the homeowners are speaking out and being loud, or as I've been saying recently, you are shouting it from your rooftops with solar panels. So the first thing that you do when you want to join a co-op is you learn about the co-op. You come to a meeting and you visit our website. You came to a meeting, hooray, you all can cross out number one because you accomplished that one. The next thing you do is that you sign up to join the co-op. There is no cost to join the co-op. There is no obligation to go solar through the co-op. This is a service we provide to help expand solar and help grow the solar industry as well. So if you have a nice sunny roof, congrats, you're in the co-op. That's all it takes. Uh, you go on to our website, uh, flsun.org. You go to the Go Solar section. You're gonna see the Central Miami North uh, co-op and you're gonna fill out your name and your address. You're gonna see a Google map that might be out of date or maybe not. And you're going to say, yep, that's my house. Put the panels there. That's not my house. Hey, those trees are gone. Oh, my roof doesn't look like that anymore. You're going to give us that kind of information. You're also, if you're joining now, going to tell us what you're looking for in a solar installer. As soon as we have 30 good roofs um, signing up, we send out a request for proposal to the installers in the state of Florida. That um, request for proposal or an RFP went out last Friday because we had 30 roofs in the Central Miami North Co-op. So now um, it's, we're waiting for these estimates to come back. So you've signed up online. I do a remote <coughs> review of your roof or one of my colleagues at Community Power Network does it. We're just taking a look at Google satellite images and we're doing measurements to say, is there 200 square feet here? Does it look nice throughout the day? Congratulations, you're in the co-op. Then you'll be getting some emails from us just explaining the co-op process, some technology, information about financing and stuff over the course of the week. When these estimates come back in, it's time to select an installer. That means that some of you guys volunteer to be on what's called a selection committee. The selection committee people are the people that like getting in the weeds. You are the ones that like looking up the ratings on the panels. You like looking up the Yelp reviews of all the installers and reading everything that you can. Uh, I put together a spreadsheet that compares every estimate that comes in and every product and every warranty, apples to apples to apples to apples so that you are able to look through the spreadsheet and say, uh, these people, they don't do slate roofs. It looks like we have four people in our co-op that have slate roofs. They're not out, they're out. 
This has um, these. This company. Uh, we have people in our co-op that only want American-made panels. This company doesn't offer American-made panels. They're out. We make it as easy as possible to make this decision. So the selection committee people, we meet up at somebody's house, we go over all the bids as well as the spreadsheet. I sit back, I am completely neutral through this process. Every decision that is made in the co-op is made by the co-op members. We don't advocate for an installer. We don't advocate for a type of panel. We don't advocate for a way to finance your system. The members of the selection committee choose an installer I let that installer know that they have the job. I let the other installers know that they didn't get the job, and I give them the feedback from the selection committees to why they didn't get it. What can they do to improve their chances for a co-op in the future, or just to be growing their business for other members that decide that they've signed up, but they're at the end of the day aren't going to join the co-op? When this installer has the information of the who has joined the co-op, that person then reaches out to the individual homeowners and puts together an estimate for them. Sometimes the first estimate they do is going to be a remote review, just like I do, but they're using much better software. Their goal is to offset you up to 100% of your FPL bill so that you would be paying $9.42. It isn't, it isn't necessary to go 100% if you're not comfortable with that. You can go 75, 50, 25, any percentage that you want. It is based on what you are most comfortable with and what your budget allows. So at this time, you're getting the estimates. When that estimate is in your hand, that's when you decide whether you want to sign a contract. If you sign a contract, hooray, I stick along with you through the whole thing as your project manager, making sure that everything goes well, that the installer has made the calls, that your permitting process has gone well. And after a whole bunch of us uh, have gone solar, we throw a really big party and all of our partners and the volunteer organizations that have been helping promote the co-ops, we celebrate and then I launch the next co-op. If you decide, as you're looking at this estimate, you usually have 30 days to make a decision. If you decide that you don't want to sign a contract, you don't sign a contract. We hope that you go solar in the future on your own um, and that we've given you the tools to make an educated decision. But at the end of the day, it is up to you, the homeowner, as to whether you want to go solar through the co-op or whether you want to do it on your own or whether you choose not to go solar at all. <clears throat> this co-op will be open through August 25th. So, see this part here, grow the co-op, tell your neighbors. Now, we don't like people telling people how much the, the costs are. Uh, a lot of things, where it's a very competitive bidding process. But you'll be telling your neighbors, you got to sign up. This is a really great deal that we're getting. Um, and there's no obligation. It's, uh, as some people would say, it's a, the, the other members have been saying, it's a no-brainer. Because if you're interested in going solar, this is just like getting an estimate that you would if you were on your own. And we encourage people to reach out to installers and get an estimate and see what it would cost to do an installation on your own. And then you compare it to what you're getting in the co-op. You might see a difference in the price. You might see a difference in the type of products. You might see a difference in the warranties. <coughs> uh, so the, the, he comes out, he does the proposal. You decide whether you're gonna sign. You get your solar installed. We have a party. This usually is about a four to eight month process. Because we're um, going to be closing at the end of August, uh, most people will be having their estimates in that September time frame, that they should be able to complete their installations by December 31st, which is um, an important thing to consider as we move on. Again, we don't make the FL Sun, we don't make the decisions for you. The um, selection committee, the co op members, you are the ones that choose the installer. Some people look for the best price, some people are all about uh, high quality um, equipment who has the most experience, who has the best warranties, are they a local company, anything that is important to you, do they offer battery backup? All of those things are um, taken into consideration by the members of the selection committee when they're sitting around the table and choosing the installer. Any questions on how the co-op works? Yes, sir? Do you have commercial properties? Or is it Some businesses that have joined in the past, usually it's that if it's um, 
it has to be that the business that's in, that owns the building is the business that is using the electricity because we don't allow third party sale in the state of Florida. Okay. But there have been businesses that have joined, I believe, other co ops. There have been churches that join. Um, usually, if it's a large installation, uh, that would um, that might get moved to the end of the line to allow for the homeowners to get their installations um, because that would be much quicker. Uh, but uh, most things are possible. You have a second question? Just, just a second part of that question. The, the threshold was 30 homes mm -hmm. to initiate. Yeah, if we've already commercial we've properties already that. were larger in scale, but there were fewer, would they still have the same criteria to be with it's, that number? Or? If, it's, if it's a commercial property that is within this area, it would be in this co-op. So that is... Considered part of, okay. Yeah. Any incentives for government building? I don't really know. I can look into that. Um, I know that I know to say that if it's churches, that they're not able to get the federal tax um, credit. But it's that um, there have I think that there have been in the past government things, but they've been their own um, co-op just because it's been such a large project, sir. What is the co-op close all the time? It's the this is a bulk discount rate, um, so it's a limited time only. So think of it as um, this is QVC, and we're selling the Roomba. And we've got 10,000 Roombas, and you've got to call now while supplies last. Because, oh, no, we just sold our 10,000. Oh, thank you so much. And then the price goes back to what it was before. So it's a limited time that an installer will um, allow people to take advantage of a discounted rate, and then they're going to go back to their regular pricing. Is there any standard criteria for these <coughs> installers that are on the list to receive the RFP? Uh, they just have to sign up. Um, oh, so they come to you and sign up as interested? Yeah, when installers, there are a lot of installers who have found out, and they can still, I mean, if they want to, they can go to our flsun.org. FL and uh, at the bottom of the page is a little button that will say um, installers get notified and they can be notified that the RFP has gone out. But it's a two-week window that they get to submit. Right, so there's no screening, it's just them going. And then the screening is up to the co-op to the center. Okay. We do, when when we're going through the um, the estimates and I'm putting together the spreadsheet, I'm checking their, their licensing. We're looking at their hiring practices. We give all of that information to the selection committee it's the same exact thing as if you were doing this all on your own. Yeah. You're just having somebody that's helping you along the way and you're making the decision with others. If you have 30 applicants that are at all come in really quickly and you have 40 other people who are interested and, and then one of those 30 decides, no, I'm not going to do it, do you have like a wait list for people? No, all of the people who sign up up through August 25th, if you have a sunny roof, you're in the co-op. Even if it's more than 30. Yeah, 30 is the only, the only thing minute. that is required is just to send out the request for proposal. But this can, we have a co-op that had 500 members. So we also, one of the things we make sure is that an installer can handle that. And an installer knows that just because there are 30 homes that signed up, it doesn't mean they're getting all 30 jobs. We have, like, there's a good closing rate through the co-ops because the people who generally come to the information sessions are people who are interested in going solar, um, but there is no guarantee as to how many people are going to actually sign a credit, but we can't make that kind of prediction. I'm going to take, if there's one more question, I can take that and then I'm going to move on. Sir? The uh, installation done before December 31st is because of uh, taxes? Yes, which we're, we're about to get into. I have to fix this, this is driving me bonkers. Okay, we're going to move on to solar economics. Solar is priced by the watt and not by the panel. The reason it's priced by the watt and not by the panel is because different panels have different wattages. There are some that are 280, there are some that are 300, there are some that are more than 300. Solar is a long-term uh, investment and we have data that shows that it does increase the resale value of homes. Um, there are no moving parts on this. You have a, the minimum of 20 to 25 year lifespan, and you have to bear in mind the rising cost of energy. FPL had just um, put into place in January an $811 million rate increase. It's going to go up again, and it's going to keep going up. 
So if you're producing energy of your own during the day, you're hedging your bets against the increase in costs. Since the 1970s, when solar first came out, the price has dropped about 90%. So, and now it's dropped even more significantly that it's no longer, more so than even 2015. So it's no longer this boutique kind of uh, specialty installation. Uh, and it's um, more affordable, but it's still pretty daunting to go out and have a bunch of contractors come to your house not knowing what the difference is between any of the panels, their efficiencies, the difference between the inverter systems. Part of your um, handout at the bottom of it um, is a sample solar cost breakdown. Now these are sample prices. This is not the pricing that we have in the state of Florida. This is just to give you a general idea. But if you figure that you're paying $3 a watt if you were to get an estimate today, if you were to do, I'm going to go to the larger system, that's what we deal with more often. If you were having a 9KW system, that price out of pocket immediately is $27,000. If you were to do it through the co-op, you'd be having your savings up to 20%, so you'd be taking off $4,500, which drops the price down to $22,500. There is also a federal tax credit in place of 30%. This was supposed to have sunsetted last year. It was extended by Congress. It is in place through uh, 2019, and then in 2020, it drops down to 26%. Uh, you, um, the federal tax credit is based on your tax implication, and it can be rolled over um, through the years. But if you were to take it immediately, you would be taking $6,750 off. That, um, and then you would figure your estimated annual electrical savings based on the 9KW system would be around $1,479. So after the first year, your cost is actually $14,271. And when we had our last information session, somebody had asked, and Mayor Stoddard had done the calculations and was saying, if you were to be figuring, if, if you were to finance this, and we'll talk about various ways to finance, that's the number that you would want to be financing. Because you know, you, he said he was recommending pay this out of pocket if you have it, because you're going to be getting it back. That is what you finance, and then you're figuring that's the cost of your system. So how do you know what size you need? Take your average daily kilowatt hour consumption. You can see that on your FPL bill. Usually, if you're able to go online, you can see it. If you're looking at your regular bill, it might show you what the monthly amount is. Divide that by 30, and you're going to figure out what your daily amount is. Divide that number by five hours. Five hours is the peak sun sunshine production that you're looking for. And that will equal your kilowatts. That's how you can size out an array. So if you had an average daily of 50 kilowatt hours, which is what I received today in an email, divide that by five, you're going to have 10 KW system. So it's pretty it's pretty simple when it's on a chalkboard. Um, <laughs> is this presentation going to be available online to the residents? Yeah. It's just so, uh, yeah. it's the, the yes. It's being, well, it's being filmed right now. Okay. So, but a lot of people like to take photos of the, of the, um, is there a soft copy? Not as yet. This is, um, I take the version that is created by Community Power Network and then I um, make it mine. So I've added this. This was today's um, new slide because I've been getting asked this question often and it's a lot easier for me to have it in the block board than to constantly ask Simon, how do I size up the system? So if you want to take a photo, take a photo. The average daily kilowatt off your FPL bill. Yeah. You can see it on your. July versus. So. You can well if you go for your average. Um, if there's sometimes you can see your average yearly. Divide that by the amount of um, days. You just want to have an average for the for a day. So you can take your entire year. You can work off of it from a month. Can you go back to the economics for one second? The um, the economics is yeah. in the handout. It's it's yes, it's in the cost breakdown. Is right there. Oh, okay, great. Yeah. Thank you. Everybody get a photo? Any electric cars here? No electric cars? Any golf carts? Okay. So 
Simon and I are the first, we're the first Chevy Bolt owners in Miami-Dade County. Um, we just picked it up on Friday. And um, if you have an electric car and you're charging it from your rooftop through the co-op, you're paying a penny a mile. That is the equivalent of 27 cents per um, gallon if it, was, um, if it was gasoline. So my trivia is, does anybody know when gasoline was last 27 cents a gallon. 1961. Now, I am not telling you to go out and buy yourself an electric car, but you could get a used Nissan Leaf for about $8,000. And if you're charging it from your rooftop with clean, renewable energy, you are paying a penny a mile. So, and you're never going to the gas station, and you're never getting an oil change. Again, so it is. Your system to be able to do that. We did that. We were we had um, we were the it's what's called net zero when you are producing as much as you're consuming. Added a few more panels because we knew we wanted an electric car, and when we're charging it from the panels, we're still at an even draw. There is a home that is in. We have six homes in our neighborhood in the Grove that are solar. One of the homes did an installation more than 60 panels to charge two Teslas. That was it. And then they moved. <laughs> so somebody else lives there. We don't know if they're charging their car. So we have another home that they're charging. They have a Tesla. They're charging their Tesla from their rooftop. Um, Mayor Stoddard, he charges his Nissan Leaf from his rooftop. It is, it, it's, one of the, I would say, I mean, it's only been a couple of days and we're like, you know, so in love with the car and so confused and not understanding the dashboard on it. But it's the coolest thing to know that it's being charged from sun. Now, financing. This, um, there's information that you can see on our website, but um, there are, all the solar installers usually offer their own terms of financing. There are also bank um, solar loans. Now, First Green Bank um, and Admiral's Bank um, both offer solar loans. There is a handout that you have called Paying for Your Panels that I had expanded some of the information on it to give you the percent interest, interest rates. Um, First Green Bank is located in Fort Lauderdale as well. Then there's PACE, which is Property Assessed Clean Energy. Uh, the PACE program, which is what brought the co-ops to Miami-Dade um, means you're not paying any money out of pocket. It is um, initially, it's tacked onto your property taxes. Now some people say that the, the interest rate is a bit steep, but it's also because you don't pay for it until it's with your property taxes. And if you sell your house before you have finished paying it off, there is the possibility of it rolling over to the next homeowner. It depends on that homeowner's mortgage lender. But it's um, the PACE program, the local uh, PACE provider for um, this area is Y Green, which is energy, spelled backwards. So Y Green works. They are um, at, in uh, Cocoa Walk at Mayfair. Um, and they do, you can be approved in like 24 hours because we had looked into them uh, initially. <coughs> There's also what's called the Solar and Energy Loan Fund. Now, if you are a woman or a veteran and you own your house, you can qualify for a special self-loan through an organization called Kiva, and they allow for um, low interest, uh, like 5%, it's paid off in five years, but for veterans and women, and then they'll say if you qualify for that, then they can cover the loans for the rest of it, but all of that information is in the handouts that you have. Do they put a lien on your house, or what is just a... It's, so um, I can't remember which ones. I remember seeing the little disclaimer about um, a lien. I don't know if it was for the solar loans or not. Um, and that's all the information is. That's best to ask. Um, best to ask the individual loans um, what you would be looking for. The like questions to ask. What's the term? Uh, is credit score? Any other criteria and requirements that they have? What is their interest rate? Is it secured against your home or is it unsecured? Are there any penalties for prepayments? And will the combination of your loan payment and the remaining electrical bill be more or less than what you paid for previously with electricity? Again, it's all individual conversations to have with whomever you are looking for. If you are looking to finance your system, 
it's best to look into this now rather than waiting for that moment that you have an estimate in your hands because this will be taking a little bit of time and you don't want to be drawing out the process even longer. So it's just getting your ducks in a row. So the, what are you going to do right now? Go to the website. Yeah, you're going to join the co-op because there's no cost to join and you don't have to go solar through the co-op. You're just getting an estimate. So you're going to flsan.org. You are going to be joining the Central Miami North Co-op. Again, this co-op closes August 25th. But if you are somebody that wants to be part of the selection committee, and I hope there are people here that want to be part of the selection committee, then sign up now because the estimates are coming back and we're going to be reviewing them and choosing an installer in the end of June. You're going to um, tell all of your friends and all of your neighbors that they should be joining the co-op. And we invite you to join our listserv. The listserv is a Google group. It's a very chatty bunch of people. They like talking about solar. These are a lot of our co-op members across the state of Florida, as well as people who went solar on their own. If you have a Google account and you sign up through this, go to your settings, go for the abridged um, version, or you'll be getting emails through the day talking about battery backup and different costs and stuff. But you, if you have any questions, and specific questions, ask the listserv because you will get an answer very quickly. Okay, that's that's lower. that right there will the combination of your loan payment yep. and the remaining electrical bill be more or less than what you paid for in electricity. Let's ask that. Got it. Yes. These are things that we just suggest like, hey, this is if you were doing it on your own. You'd be saying, oh, I should have been asking that. FLSun.org, you're going to go to the Go Solar section. This is here. You can join the conversation. That's the listserv. Um, you can get involved. You can volunteer. These are some interesting websites. Um, this right here, pbwatts.enroll.gov, allows you to size out your system, but using the math equation that I gave you, it's another way to easily size out your system. Uh, this right here, you can just Google, Google Project Sunroof. You put in your address, and it will show you how many hours of sunshine shine on your house a year. Um, their costs that they say for solar and your installations, their numbers are using like a national average, so they're not exactly right. Um, but it is, uh, and Key Biscayne will be part of it. West, the western part of Miami, Google hasn't gotten to them yet. Um, but Project Sunroof is, um, is very cool. One thing to bear in mind is that the Google Maps seem to be out of date for our county. They were up to date, and then they went back to like pre-solar days. Mm -hmm. um, so they, you could be looking at something, and it might not notice if you've done any renovations on your home. And in one instance this morning, it was including a woman's pool enclosure as a um, viable area. So when we're doing our remote reviews, I'm able to look and see and do the proper measurements. And that concludes tonight's show. <laughs> Anybody is interested in joining the co-op right here and now, our volunteers will be outside on Wi-Fi and can sign you up. It takes about three minutes to join. Um, if you want to do it from home, you can also upload your electrical bill. It's not necessary right at this point in time. It's something you can send to the installer. Um, but when the installer is um, is awarded the job, they will get the information about your house and also see your electrical bill because they have to see the, to know how much you're consuming. But we can tell people that they can sign up until August 25th? Yes. Or you said a June date or something. We're selecting, we're selecting the installer at the end of June, but this co-op is open to new members. So tell everybody you know, uh, because I, I want to get, I, mean, I ideally like every sunny house in Miami to have solar panels on it. Um, but it's telling your friends. We also have um, yard signs that you can take. Um, if you know that you have a, a roof, it's also one thing to consider is um, if you have a roof that is more than 10 years old, have somebody take a look at it and just make sure that it's in good shape. The installer will give pricing to know what the cost is to remove the panels and to reattach them if, it's, um, if you need to do any kind of repairs. Um, but uh, if you have a new roof that's in 
great shape or you have a roof that's middle age, you don't want to have to take the panels off unnecessarily. I think you select the installer in June without knowing the homes and the cost of the system on each home. And because the installers know the areas, they'll say, okay, we have homes in Coral Gables, we have homes in the city of Miami, we have homes in Key Biscayne, and they, these are the products that they sell that they would offer to people. It's usually the same products that they're selling and, and they're installing. It's just that they're taking their normal model and they're giving it that bulk rate. Ma'am? So if the warranty is 20 years, after 20 years we start to see the problems, then we all have to consider that in 20 years we have to start over again. Okay. No, the, the, they still, the panels will are rated for, they have a 25 year production warranty. They're still working after 25 years. They're just not working at the same efficiency. Right. That's what I'm but with efficiency, it's the same thing. I mean, that's, that's the time pass. It's like anything, you know, it's like time anything. we have to reconsider to it. And maybe I am the one that in 1992 here in Andrew, I installed solar lighting for Great Creek and Home, six and a half acres. The guarantee was 10 years. After 10 years, we start to see it, that they were they were not illuminated all night. We start to see in all the deficiencies on the solar panels with battery backup. So the only solution after that 15 years was to replace everything again. It would be like anything that you purchase in your home. Right, like a your refrigerator only yeah. lasts for, you know, it's rated for 15 years. It'll still be working for 20 years. It's just that right. you might have ice building up in the ice maker. Right, sir? Well, what's the efficiency, the average like efficiency right now? Because it keeps going up, it's what, 19%, 20 something, 23, 25. Those, the specific kind of numbers? Okay. I probably knew them and they just kind of went out of my head. Their the panels have been their technology itself has not changed that drastically. Panels are more efficient than they were. They have more watts than they used to. And we have like you can go on YouTube and see some of these panels, like they can withstand hailstorms. They have um, pickup trucks driving over them to make sure that they are able to withstand the test of time and weather. Um, for your experience, what's the best way to share this information with neighbors so that they also act? Um, the first thing you do is you sign up and you join the co-op. And then you tell your friends, I just joined the co-op. And you can share with them the link. You can um, like our page on Facebook, share that with them. It's FL Sun, um, FL with a space, Sun. Um, and just uh, spreading word and spreading it through next door. There are going to be more information sessions, two taking place in August, one in Coral Gables for this particular um, co-op, and then one at the Unitarian Universalist for the South Co-op. So if you know people in Pinecrest and South Miami Kendall, they can join as well. Um, and that'll be August 15th and 16th that we just want to say, hey, you know, this is, it's here. And if there are people, I'll still be going around and talking solar two homes, I'm just not going to be doing big information sessions, but um, I can also, I can send you the flyers that we have. You just have to just email me as I get back to it. That's my email address down there. You can email me and I can send you materials and put out a yard sign. As soon as people see the yard sign, then they're getting curious. What are the, uh, I mean, first, thank you. You're welcome. I think this is awesome. I'm glad that Bethel Sun is trying to create enough awareness and enough community to fight, but it's a very powerful utility body. Yeah. I mean, we all, FPL doesn't like this, and it's pretty clear by the amendment that was tried to be passed in the last elections, where essentially they're saying, if you go solar, you got to pay us, because you're going off grid. A Some lot states, of misinformation in that amendment is right. very upsetting. A lot of states have gone off net metering because of the utility. So where does Florida stand? So it's political commitment to this, despite the lobbying by FDA. It's hard to say. Um, my goal is to try to get uh, our representatives to go solar, because there is that whole needy philosophy, the not in my backyard. Um, when it affects you personally, you have a vested interest and you want to fight for it. Um, so if we're able to get elected officials to go solar, 
the fight becomes even stronger. But it's also just the simple strength in numbers. Uh, there have been states that have stopped net metering and then they had to bring it back and grandfather homes in. Um, and in terms of like with the utility, it's until we hit like a critical mass um, of solar homes uh, that would actually affect the grid and you would need, I mean, some would say 30% or at least 11% or under 1% right now in the right. state of Florida. So there's some room. Yeah. yeah. And good unincorporated, good problem to address yeah. Well. yeah. Unincorporated Day County has like hundreds of thousands of homes and mm -hmm. in three years time, there were only 122 permits pulled for residential solar. Yeah. So we have a lot of untapped potential in this county. Is that uh, all applied for single-family homes, or do you have experience with homeowners associations and condominiums? It's best the, it works best with single-family homes. Um, condominiums, it's usually for the shared space. Um, sometimes they can trigger an assessment, um, and then you have to get everybody interested in wanting. If it's a small condominium and they have their own um, a room, where the meters are and people are have their own meter, there is the possibility of going solar in the rooftop and everybody just splitting up and dividing how many panels there are and two going here and two going there. Uh, how much it offsets the overall utility, I don't know. Sir? You might have mentioned this. Um, just curious, how are FL Sun and PC Sun, how are they funded their source of revenue? Grants. Grants. Yes. We also have now when if if a homeowner signs a, like a contract, the installer will pay FL Sun a developer fee, which is makes up for them not having to go out and canvas. So it's um, it works for everything. Yeah. Yeah, and it was something we it wasn't done. It was um, the homeowners that were in the co-ops started complaining and saying that you're working for free and that isn't fair. Um, for you as a nonprofit, so it was a practice that was implemented at the insistence of the members of the co ops themselves because it wasn't the, the model that was originally set up. Now, Jody, I just want to thank you. I also want to thank the Key Biscayne Community Foundation for making this happen. Good. Thank, really, thank you. Thank you. Tesla is producing about the tires? Yes, they're not available in the state of Florida because they are not Miami-Dade windstorm compliant. <laughs> so until they get until they get rated for windstorms, it's something that's really beautiful to look at from afar. Like really far, far, like California far. Um, they, I know that they were going to be opening up in Orlando, but as far as we know, they have not gotten, we have two certifications down here. There's the Florida Solar Energy Center, which is through the University of Central Florida, um, which does like the statewide certifications. And then we have Miami-Dade um, windstorm compliance. If they can't handle our storms, they're not going up on the roof as far as we know. But if they do get their certifications, and they want to participate in the co-op, Tesla, you're welcome to be part of it. Just sign up for the RFP. <laughs> Sir? So for the average square footage per kilowatt of uh, system capacity installed, more or less, or no? Simon, do you know? Yeah, well, for 250 watt panels makes a kilowatt, right? And Jody was saying each panel is three by five, so that's 15 square feet times four would be 60 square feet per kilowatt. Thank you. I was, a, I was an advertising creative director before doing this and started doing this as a volunteer through Amendment 4 and Amendment 1. Uh, and I was just super passionate about solar. And sitting around with a group of people, I kept saying, if I could talk solar all day, I would. And we were at a League of Women Voters meeting when they started talking about the co-ops. And Simon volunteered me to be on a committee to work on the co-op. Suddenly I was the chair of the committee. Suddenly there was funding for the position and I was applying for it and now I get to talk solar all day. And I love it. For, yes, sir? Uh, if you can take, like, for the whole co-op, like an average installation price for everybody or every, if your installation is more involved in some way, you get to pay more. When the estimates come in, 
will see pricing. There's, there's different pricing. It could be upcharges based on roof types. So a standing seam metal roof that doesn't have any perforations could be one cost. An asphalt shingle can be another cost. And concrete barrel tile might be another cost. There might be like, it's like 15 cents, 30 cents more per watt, depending on the roof type that you have, which is a standard practice, whether it's in a co-op or whether you're doing it through an installer um, on your own. An installer will just, the, those costs won't be broken down line item for you as a homeowner and an individual. But when you see it in a large group, you're gonna be seeing, okay, all the asphalt shingle people, this is your price, and all the concrete barrel tile people, this is you, and the flat roof people, this is you. Uh, those of you that are looking for the Canadian panels, this is your cost. The ones who want the American ones, this cost. If you want the panels that are made in Florida, that's your cost. So there are all these different prices. Everything is broken down. And it doesn't matter um, if we have six homes that are concrete barrel tile. The only difference between their installation costs are going to be the particular products that they choose and the size of the system that they install but they'll be guaranteed locked in prices, um, but there will be a different cost if you have this type of roof or that type of roof, and if you did a ground mount installation or you did a rooftop. And is there a minimum um, amount of panels that you can... We try to look for, installers like to do 3KW, but it can be down to 2KW. So it can be an eight, an eight to 12 panel, um, and the reason um, being is that you want something that's going to be generating enough electricity to be noticeable on your bill. That's the, it's for you, the end goal. Sir? Yes, so the, oh, oh, okay. here. you can go. <laughs> uh, the co-op discount, 10 to 20%, um, is that something that's across the board, everyone in the co-op receives whatever percentage is The discounts, um, the, the the discount rate is um, that whatever the installer would be doing typically, he does or she does a reduction that can be up to that amount um, seen across the board. And it's and it's an up to 20% because some co-ops have, it can be 15%. Broward County, we had a homeowner sitting in a, the information session with an estimate on her own who was in the co-op and she was there just to say, I have an estimate that I did on my own, I have the estimate from the co-op that was banging on 20%. Um, what's the determination of that range between 10 and 20? The installer. Just the installer? Mm -hmm. Some installers um, some installers submit um, their estimates and they have no discounts. And I'm surprised they don't get chosen. <laughs> <laughs> Sir? If there's ever a dispute between the installer and one single homeowner, is that fellow's son involved in that at all? We try to, yeah, we'll try to step in and help things out, sort things out. We have, we're still in communication with homeowners from installations that were back in 2015. That if there are any issues that they're dealing with. Sir? Yeah, how many years do you think the estimate for when you offset the cost of installation and equipment in safety? You nodded. I'm, I'm looking at you to answer that. Well, it's, 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 a, it's a tough question to answer That's because it. I'm not thinking of that just in terms of how long it take this system to pay back. Mm -hmm. you, Jody, you, you're better at that. About eight years, six to eight years. Does that sound about right? It's. Um, we have one co-op member who said her system was going to be paid off in um, four and a half years. Um, it could be seven. It could be eight years. Um, I thought our system was paying itself off the day that we had it turned on, and we started um, generating energy. Is it a big factor that once it's paid off, then you're you're on the positive side? Yeah, free and clear. Free and clear. Yeah, that's a huge. Yes. Twenty years. So you use the term estimates and you use the term bids. They're the same thing. Sorry. And is it a hard bid? I mean, are they giving you a hard bid, or are they saying, "Well, we estimate"? No, these are these are the numbers. These are locked in prices. So that when somebody is getting their when they get it, there's nothing hidden that they just go, where'd that come from? Right. Sir. Is there a big differential in, in the price that you get on the credit score for your energy that is used versus what you usually pay? Yeah. Well, it's you're paying um, about thirteen cents a kilowatt hour from FPL. 
as opposed to you're not paying uh, because you're creating it yourself. Um, and then the wholesale rate for the surplus is purchased at three cents. So they're purchasing it from you under three cents and then they're selling it for 13 cents and they make a dime off of every kilowatt hour that you're producing. Except for the, the credits. I mean, you're, you're doing no, a credit Yeah, surplus. Yeah. I, I think it's an important benefit when you get the direct yeah. credit. It's, and that the credit that it rolls over every month until the end of the year, and then if there is extra. Now, some people some people don't have see the credit. They just, they're breaking even, or some people are just offsetting by like 50%, and they're happy with that. And if people are concerned that the credit is going to go away suddenly, then make the kilowatt hours while the sun shines and try to take advantage of it in one fell swoop. Sir? Do you have to go to a store through these co-ops, it's you're doing it with you're choosing an installer, so it is through an installer. It's this is not a it's not a buyer's club where you're purchasing panels and then doing the installations on your own. The reason I'm asking is because you know, most people pay for uh, the, the solar board for the function and it's perpendicular to the sunlight, right? so it has to follow the sun, the sunlight just like sunflower does, right? So but these are the problems that fix. There is um there's like a single standing, it's like I think called the sunflower. Um it's really, really expensive and kind of cool, but it tracks it's like a big flower and it tracks. And then solar also? That's it's not part of what we do. I don't even know if they're available. Um, here. Thank you.